Welcome to a night of total terror. Zombies! You'd think we'd be done with them by now, but there are still zombie books and zombie comic books and zombie movies and zombie TV shows and zombie parades. Can we move on to, like, harpies or manticores or something? We can't seem to let zombies go, and, and there are a bunch of theories as to why. What makes most sense to me is that disease remains the final serious predator of mankind, and dead people are a pretty serious reminder and traditionally a serious cause of disease, so yeah, dead people are scary. And they're scarier when they start moving around. Of course, there's also the whole brain-eating thing, which leads me to prions. Not prions, which are spelled the same, but pronounced differently and are birds, and also not prions, which are pronounced the same but spelled differently and are theoretical point particles that quarks may be composed proteins are very of. Similar. But, but the real problem here isn't that the incorrectly folded proteins are dangerous, but that they're also really good at convincing healthy proteins to change shape to the dangerous form. As prions convert more and more healthy proteins into prions like themselves, they clump together and accumulate in brain tissue. These clumps of prions kill the brain cells, causing holes in the brain which lead to the brain tissue getting, like, literally spongy, which is why the the technical term for mad cow disease is bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which literally translated means cow spongy brain disease. I like how sometimes when you translate a Latin name to an English one it makes scientists sound like four-year-olds. Spongy brain tissue diseases, it turns out, make you super weird and then eventually dead. Symptoms of these diseases include unsteady gait, deterioration of speech, increased jerkiness of movement, and as the disease progresses, bouts of uncontrollable laughter, urinary and fecal incontinence, you know, the normal zombie stuff. There are, by the way, no cures for prion diseases. You zombify and then you die. So you might be wondering, 
We humans aren't super accustomed to eating brains or spinal cords or anything, so who even gets a prion disease in the first place? Well, sometimes, very rarely, the proteins can misfold in the brain all by themselves, and sometimes people get stuff like Creutzfeldt Jakob disease because they've gotten a blood transfusion with contaminated blood or had surgery where the surgical implements weren't properly sterilized. But usually, people get CJD from eating meat from infected animals, which is why they killed all those cows in the UK back in the day, and why we don't, you know, feed cow brains to cows anymore. Back to brain eating, though. We must examine the bizarre case of Kuru, a prion disease found in the foray people of Papua New Guinea. Until the 1950s, the forays had a custom of consuming their dead at mortuary feasts. You know, like you do. The men of the tribe customarily ate the muscles of their deceased friend, while women and children ate the brain. Other good news? When someone dies of a prion disease in 100% of cases, so far, they have remained dead. A brutal killer invades a traveler's blood. He said it was very, very critical that you get to medicine that quickly, otherwise you're dead. I've been to Africa 11 times. We were there three and a half months ago, and I was there for a little over three weeks. But two weeks into the trip, Dwight suddenly starts to feel unwell. I just started to feel very, very weak. One day you wake up and you're just, you're so weak that you can't hardly get out of bed. I just got weaker and weaker and weaker until I was so weak I couldn't stand on my own. What's astounding is that the illness that has Dwight fighting for his life started with a simple fly bite. Africa is a big place and there's different animals, different pests in different places, but in Tanzania, you have the titsy flies. They are about the size of a house fly and normally a little bit bigger, but they're just extremely aggressive and you just hate to have them pestering you all day long. But the tsetse fly that bit Dwight wasn't just a nuisance. It was infected with a deadly parasite, a single-celled killer called Trypanosoma. And when the fly bit him, these parasites flooded into Dwight's bloodstream. Inside his body, these cunning intruders began to divide and elongate. They used their long tails, called flagellum, to swim throughout his bloodstream. The result is a severe case of trypanosomiasis, or African sleeping sickness. Dwight's immune system is helpless to stop the microscopic assassins. Each individual trypanosoma parasite is armed with a shield of proteins. In the bloodstream, white blood cells recognize these proteins as foreign, and they build up antibodies that attack the proteins. But trypanosomes can actually change their protein coat of armor, rendering the blood's antibodies useless. This leaves them free to reproduce and devastate the body's red blood cells, the very cells that carry nutrients and oxygen throughout the body. Starved of nutrients, the patient goes They're into coming a coma to get and you, Barbara. Dies.
if you get infected with the brain-eating amoeba, you're in big trouble. This parasite is an out-and-out -out killer. But while its actions often have deadly consequences, the amoeba hijacks the brain for a benign reason. To find food and shelter. Inside the brain, the amoeba has a perfect environment to feed and reproduce. You have food, heat, moisture. It's perfect for them to live their lives. The amoeba has a two-pronged attack. First, it hijacks the host cells using special feet called pseudopods. Then, the amoeba cuts a hole in the cell wall. And when the contents of the cell leak out, the amoeba eats them. Not only are the amoeba ruthless killers, they also have a cunning method of evading the body's immune system. The amoeba can defend itself by forming a coat, which is called a cyst. And this coat surrounds the amoeba and is impervious to the host's immune system. When the body's white blood cells attack, the amoeba forms its protective coat. The white blood cells latch onto the coat, but can't get through. Then the amoeba sheds the coat and escapes unharmed, leaving the white blood cells behind. What happens is that when the amoeba gets into the brain, in a sense, it's holding the brain hostage. So when the body sends in its immune system to try to defuse the hostage situation, often it does even more damage as a result. The amoeba lives in a cyst in sediment on the bottom of lakes. As the water warms, the amoeba emerges from the cyst and begins to divide. At this stage, the amoeba can infect humans. When conditions become unfavorable, the amoeba forms a cyst again, and the life cycle repeats. And even in warm water, some simple measures can protect swimmers. The way to prevent deaths from occurring, first of all, is to educate the public about this disease. And secondly, it would be very important to wear nose plugs when doing recreational activities, such as diving or wakeboarding, where you're underwater quite a bit.